God Almighty says in the Holy Quran, and I begin after Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. وَلَوْ أَنَّ أَهْلَ الْقُرَىٰ آمَنُوا وَاتَّقَوْا لَفَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ بَرَكَاتٍ مِّنَ السَّمَاءِ لَفَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ بَرَكَاتٍ مِّنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَكِنْ كَذَّبُوا فَأَخَذْنَاهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ If the people of the towns had been faithful and god weary <coughs> conscious of God, pious, we would have opened to them blessings from the heaven and the earth, <coughs> but they denied, they rejected, they belied. So we seized them because of what they used to earn. According to this translation, that is. If we review the tafasir, even without knowing the details of who in particular was this verse referring to, what occasion was this refer verse brought down to address, the, just by reflecting on the gist of what is being described here, without knowing the specifics and particulars, we get an image here of God saying that if they had believed, and if they had acted according to that belief and been pious, then God would have opened up for them blessings from the heavens and the earth. They would have gained this special, this special type of the positives and the pros of something God has planted in the system that He's created. If you do so and so, if you believe what is right, and if you act according to it, then you will reap those benefits and the fruits of that tree. However, what happened was this group of individuals, this, this people, what, what did they actually do instead? Instead of believing and being pious, what they did was they rejected. They, they belied what was told to them. Or they rejected that blessing. They didn't act according to it. They didn't fulfill those two conditions of faith and taqwa, iman and taqwa. And so the result was God dealt with them based on what they did. He dealt with them. He deprived them of those blessings because of what they had done, because of their lies, because of their rejection, because of what they used to earn. بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ I seek refuge with God Almighty from every form of evil, especially the evil of my own choices, my own actions, the evil from my own soul. And I seek refuge with God from every satanic creature, whether it's a human or a jinn. Every creature that acts to serve the greater project of shaitan. The one who refused 
to worship God as God wanted to be worshipped. Although they say that shaitan worshipped God for thousands of years, before that test in which he failed, it was that test through which God revealed the nature of shaitan, revealed the type of person that shaitan chose to be. It was that test, that test in which he told them to bow down to Adam. Along with the other angels, shaitan was of the jinn, but he was amongst the angels, perhaps as some say, because of his worship for God for those thousands of years. But he failed the test because of his arrogance, because he rejected to bow down to somebody that God had created from clay, because he believed that he was better than him, because he was made of fire. It was that test, dear brothers and sisters, through which shaitan fell from the grace, fell from that station, fell from that status in the eyes of God. You remember in Dua, dua Abi Hamza, I believe it was in Dua Abi Hamza, when we start to recall our sins and we start to reflect after we think of how God has done so many good things to us and how He's he is the one worthy of all the devotion. But then we reflect on how what we have done. And then in one part of it it says, وَأَسْقَطَّنِي مِنْ عَيْنِكَ فَمَا بَالَيْتْ And then I fell from your eye of favor and I didn't care. It's like, imagine there's somebody that you care about how they think of you. You care that your parents see you in a positive light. You care that your loved ones see you as somebody who is respectful and honorable. You care because this is a sense of dignity. It's a sense of feeling like you want to be closer to what is excellent. Because deep down you're innately driven to want to become closer to God. Which is the epitome of excellence, God. So you feel like you want to be closer to what is seen as excellent, what is really good. Now imagine... There's somebody that you really care about and you're worried that you fall out of their eye, you fall from their eye of favor. They no longer see you in a favorable light. Asqattani min aynika. I fell from your eye of favor and I didn't care. It's when I've delved into those sins, God forbid, may God keep us all away from sins. It's when I've challenged God Almighty it's not only, God forbid, that I've challenged the master of the heavens and the earth, Jabbar al samawati wal ard but rather that I didn't care that I fell from his eye of favor. That hurts. Because of that type of an act, <coughs> Shaitan failed his test. He didn't care enough To let go of that ego of his, to stomp on his arrogance. He didn't care enough about God's, fa God's eye of favor. And so he disobeyed God. And that arrogance led him further into sinning until this day. His life's goal is to make sure that the children of Adam don't, don't look good. He wants to make sure that the children of Adam are exposed as inferior to him. He wants to make sure that the children of Adam fail as much as possible. This is what happens because of that arrogance, because of not having the taqwa, even if he believed in God, even if he knew God existed, but he didn't have the taqwa. And so that led shaitan to, be, to succumb to arrogance. And nurtured arrogance within him, and led, it to, led him to succumb to it, and then it led him to fall from the favor of God. To this day, how many a people's misguidance and being led astray is due to and thanks to shaitan's plotting? Who says that he's going to stand on the path, try to stand before us, on, our, on each of our sides, behind us, trying to find a way to get us into a trap. 
And you see, shaitan may find different types of traps for different types of people. Some people may be tested with their desires. Challenges related to relations with the opposite gender, for example. Other people, they may not face that type of a challenge. For example, in the Hausa, Hausa students, at least my impression is it's not that's not a big of a challenge a big challenge for them in the Hausa cities like in Najaf or Qom. This is not the main challenge that Hausa students would face. Although it's probably a big challenge that many of the youth face in America, in Lebanon, in the general communities, even in Iraq. But in the seminary towns, in the shrine towns of Najaf and Qom, this is probably less of an issue. Because generally these are more conservative towns in the sense of the way the public, in the public sphere, the way that the genders are typically separated. The way that people go about their lives is a little bit generally more conservative than you would find in other places in the world. However, a Hausa student, for instance, would face a different type of challenge. You see the Muraja, when they give advice to the Hausa students that come to them, you may hear the following advice. They might tell them, do not participate in the gatherings in which people are being backbit. When backbiting is taking place, that's not where you should be. You shouldn't participate in the gatherings where people are wasting time. You shouldn't participate in the gatherings where envy reigns. Envy amongst students, envy amongst scholars, God forbid. Yes, you may be like, well, should a scholar have envy? Should a student have envy? Of course not. But that's what I'm saying. You may not find everybody has the same type of challenge. They face different types of challenges. Other people may be facing a challenge with anger. Some people may be very kind of, uh, have, have a very kind of level-headed temperament. They're not easily brought to become frustrated or angered. Other people, no. It may be that for whatever disposition or for whatever factors of their upbringing or environment, they may be more easily frustrated and angered. So their test is in how to control their anger. What I'm trying to say is, each of us has our own set of challenges. Each of us has our own set of exams. Some people may be successful to commit to their daily prayers. Some people may be successful to commit to Salat al-Layl. Other people may be successful to have better relations with their neighbors, with their, let alone their family members. Do I allow things that I am good at and things that I'm doing well in, do I allow that to make me feel overconfident so that I fail when it comes to my real test and my real exam? You see, my real exam could be similar to the one that shaitan faced. Shaitan <laughs> was known to have been worshipping God for those thousands of years, as they say. But his test was when it came to the new guy on the scene that God had created and said he would make him a successor on earth. Shaitan failed in that exam despite having worshipped God for thousands of years. The bottom line is, worship God as He wants to be worshipped. Not as we imagine worship should be. God's way of worship is the way to be worshipped. أَتُعَلِّمُونَ اللَّهَ بِدِينِكُمْ In Surah Al-Hujurat, do you teach God your own religion? Who, do, who teaches who? Do we teach God, God forbid, or are we trying to learn the religion? These are just reminders for something that makes sense deep down if we reflect on it. But we find that these are the reminders that we get in the words of Ahl al-Bayt and in the reminders of the Qur'an. I started with this verse because I, I ended yesterday talking about the position of this special group, the Ummah al-Muslimah. That the Qur'an is leading us to realize, taking a lead from some of the hints and insights that I mentioned from Samah Sayyid Sam al-Badri on how to read the Qur'an through the Qur'an to find Ahl al-Bayt 
in the Quran and through the Quran, by connecting the different verses together, we reached a point where we realized there is a special group from the descendants of Abraham through Ismail, amongst whom this special group which submitted God in a very special submitted to God in a very special way that was coupled with the prayer of Abraham and Ismail Ishmael for themselves when they asked for a special level of submission to God from amongst that Ummah al-Muslimah God would select the Rasul Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so the question is where is this member of that group today in our life today there is not a nation there is not a community except that there was a warner amongst them in one report one of the imams السلام, looks at this verse to show people how this in indicates the need for an imam in every age because somebody might say, well, yeah, we had the Nadir. The Nadir was Muhammad. We had the Warner. The Warner was Muhammad. Why do we need somebody today? And the, the Imam would ask him, according to that report, did, you, did the ones who delivered his message, is it right now, do you have his message delivered to you by somebody appointed by him? Where is, the, where is his message? How do you know his message today? During his time, he would send delegations, he would send emissaries, right? What about today? Where is his emissary? Where is his delegation that is holding his message and not just their understanding of what might be his message? Where is that warner that the one sent on behalf of the warner to give you the warning? You see the nadir, he's the connection, right? To God. But who is giving you what he's trying to say? He didn't go physically to every person on earth during his day. He sent people out representing him to deliver the message. What about when he died? When he departed this world? What about them? Who did he send to deliver his message? Because if you say that he didn't send anybody to deliver the message, then where is the point of having the nadir, the warner? Where is he? This indicates that there must be somebody to deliver that message, the warner. As I mentioned, I think yesterday or before yesterday, the difference, however, is when he's alive, the person he sends to you doesn't have to be perfect and infallible and impeccable. Why? Because if that guy does a mistake, he's still there to figure how to, mend, how to make amends, how to fix it, how to send somebody else to correct the idea, so on and so forth. Because he's still around. He's the main personality there to be the reference point on earth. But when he dies and departs this world, that is not a possibility anymore. He's not there to correct what's going on. So whoever he leaves behind to deliver his message, to send those to be the emissary to be the ambassador must be somebody who is not going to err who's going to take his position of being correct when he delivers what he's saying he's not bringing a new message he's preserving the message of that nadir he's being a guide to the message of the nadir to every people there is a guide and some riwayat of ahlul bayt the reports indicate that the key example of the guide is Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him. Now, with that in mind, remember the verse I started with today. If only, if the people of the towns had been faithful and god wary, we would have opened to them blessings from the heaven and the earth, but they denied. So we seized them because of what they used to earn. So the question is, where is that representative of Prophet Muhammad today? Oh. I've spoken about this through to using reasoning, kind of just looking what could what the verdict of sound reasoning would be. 
in the previous nights, but today I'm trying to look through the lens of the Qur'an. What does the Qur'an share with us about why we don't have direct access to our Imam today? We know that he must exist, whether it's through the indications from the Qur'an, or from Hadith al-Thaqalain, or from the understanding that there must be 12 Imams based on the preponderance of those reports, or because of generation after generation of trustworthy scholars, rigorous scholarship passing down generation after generation, the news that there is, these are the Imams, one after the other, previous Imams, such, to such an extent that it commanded the devotion of a community that was the vast majority of the Shia population throughout history, generation after generation, despite their imam at some points being a child less than 10 years of age, it still commanded their complete devotion. And they passed it down generation after generation up until the news about the 12th imam. But the question is then, where is the 12th imam today? Why don't we have direct access to him? This verse sheds light on part of the answer. God has the blessings there. God put the system in place. God did what is befitting of His wisdom, what is befitting of His justice, what is befitting of His generosity. He provided the system where if you were to behave in a certain way, you would access these blessings from the heavens and the earth. But there are consequences because this whole world is an exam and is a test. If we do not do our part, if we do not act in a way that is informed by and sprouts from our Iman and our Taqwa, Amanu wa Taqaw, then we will be deprived of those blessings. Not because they are not available. They are available. For those who act according to what is required, who, those who have Iman and Taqwa, the access will be opened up. The access will be opened up to the extent that a person it would be wise to provide them. Because the one behind the whole system is the all-wise. And so now we have an additional layer of understanding that the Qur'an is giving us hints at. That if those people had had the taqwa, had the iman and the taqwa, they acted in according to that message that they believed in, then God would have opened up those blessings. So what stops us from realizing the Imam of our time? What stops us from having access to the Imam of our time? In some reports, the Imam has told us, Imam Sahab al-Zaman salam according to some reports, he basically he says, nothing keeps us from our Shia except what they do that is not favorable to us. That's things that they do that are unfavorable to us. So sinning or doing things that are not favored by God. This keeps us from the Imam. So the first step in order to receive this most supreme manifestation of God's blessing, which is the existence of the Imam, which is access to the Imam, to, to, in order for us to reap those blessings, to benefit from that presence, the first step, dear brothers and sisters, is to commit not only to have the Iman, but also the Taqwa. We've been talking about things that are related to Iman. We've been talking about our worldview. You see, knowing things is one thing, then submitting to what you know with your heart is another thing, and then there's a third level, which is now to act according to it. I'll give you a three, three-pronged model that is based on something that is usually discussed in metaphysics about explaining the nature of a human's free will or a person's free will choices. Just as a model to help us kind of get, wrap our minds around this. Whenever you want to do something by your own choice, 
you go through several stages if you think about it. For example, let's say I feel thirsty. In order for me to alleviate the thirst, I imagine first what could alleviate my thirst. Think of the idea. Then if I found the right idea, my heart latches onto it and believes, yes, that will alleviate my thirst. That will quench my thirst. The third level, so the first one is tasawwur, conceptualizing, thinking of something, having the image in the mind. The second is tasdiq, believing that that indeed is what you imagined, or you're imagining some judgment about what, you're, what you conceptualized. You believe in some judgment about what you conceptualized. You're imagining the water that it would that it could quench, and then you believe that the water could quench your thirst. Then the third level comes when you start to yearn for it. You have this emotional attachment or this love for that which you had in mind. You start to yearn for it. And then after that there comes the step of making the decision to do it, to, to do something about it. Making the choice. So you imagine, if I go and pick up this water, it would quench my thirst. Then you believe, if I do so, I will quench my thirst. Then you yearn for it. And then you make the, by the way, this happens all in a split second, maybe less than a second. These can happen in a very, in a very short period of time. But sometimes, you may delay each step of the process, and you can see how they all kind of, they, they all actually can be analyzed in this way. That last step, that step when you make the choice and decision, it's an, it's an aspect of your exercise of your free will, your will, your choice making. When you conceptualize that God exists, you realize the proofs and the arguments. First you start with imagining, you hear either somebody says it to you, you start to conceptualize it, you read it in a book, you hear it in a lecture, in some way, shape, or form, it, you conceptualize it. Then the next step is, did that make sense? Is that true? Does that follow logically? So you have a step of belief. Now, then there are things that are related to that worldview. You may become attached to it. Your spiritual attachment becomes connected to those ideas. You start to develop this love. You can also apply this model to when you're looking at the words of the supplication and the dua. You start to realize what does that name mean. Now you believe that God is that name. Then you start to have this emotional attachment or spiritual attachment to what that name means. Now you can imagine this applies to your course of action. And you start to apply the model in that way. When it comes to our worldview, there's a course of action that is entailed by it. When you realize that God exists, the first thing is, the first action is an action of your heart. Believe. Submit. Now that you realize this is the truth, then believe. Submit your heart to this reality. And not, not be amongst those جَحَدُوا بِهَا وَاسْتَيْقَنَتْهَا أَنفُسُهُمْ those who rejected it despite the fact that their souls knew it to be true. And then there's another layer of action, which is, okay, the fact that God exists and I believe it, the fact that I know God sent prophets, I believe it. The fact that I know that the final prophet sent was Muhammad because of the miracle of the Qur'an. And I believe it. The fact that I know he is the seal of all prophets and messengers because that miracle of the Quran says Khatamun Nabiyyin, the seal of all prophets. That means that I don't need to waste my time with any claims that came after Prophet Muhammad to be prophets. Because I already know that he is the seal of all prophets. When I believe there must be an Imam, when I believe that these must be twelve, then I can Right off the bat, say any other claim to imama that does not specify that they are exactly 12, I know I don't even need to waste my time with their claim. 
because it's already been established to be true. These are courses of action or the absence of action that are entailed by what we know. Furthermore, if I know that the whole point of sending prophets and messengers and imams is not only so that I have a clear understanding of the universe, but so that I have a clear roadmap for my personal actions and decisions, as an individual, as a community, as a world, then I also know that I should first and foremost be lear trying to learn and figure out what is the roadmap, what is the prescription that these divine leaders have left for us. This brings us to the next point. If the actions of the wrongdoers or the shortcomings of the followers of the Imams have prevented us from reaping the blessings of having direct access to the Imam of our time, then what do we do about it? As you all know, we refer to the experts. We refer to the upright experts who are Ruat Hadith Ahl al-Bayt They are the ones who relay, transmit the words of Ahl al-Bayt. Of course, this is not a transmission of mere memorization. It's not a transmission of mere photocopying like just any other extra copy that you may have of a Qur'an or a compilation of hadith. This is a transmission of understanding, a transmission of specialty, a transmission of practice as well. Because these are not individuals that we refer to simply because they are knowledgeable. These are individuals we refer to because they are upright in their character. And they follow the, the example of Ahlul Bayt if they are not as such, then they are not qualified. Because the type of qualifications we're looking for in this matter are not merely academic qualifications. We're looking for those who were truly the disciples of the Imams, generation after generation. And is this something that we were left without any guidance from the Qur'an and Ahlul Bayt? Not at all. The Qur'an itself leads us to this. The words of Ahl al-Bayt lead us, lead us to this. And the dictates of sound reason lead us to this. These are three levels. Today, I'll just mention one of them, at least. If there's enough time, I might get into the third one. The Holy Quran says, وَمَا كَانَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لِيَنْفِرُوا كَافَّةً فَلَوْلَا نَفَرَ مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِّنْهُمْ طَائِفَةٌ يَتَفَقَّهُوا فِي الدِّينِ وَلِيُنْذِرُوا قَوْمَهُمْ إِذَا رَجَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَحْذَرُونَ Yet it is not for the faithful to go forth en masse. But why should there not there go forth a group from each of their sections to become learned in religion and to warn their people when they return to them so that they may beware. Surah 9, verse 122. This is one of the key verses used to indicate that there has been, even during the time of the Prophet, let alone the time of the Imams, let alone the time in which we do not have direct access to the Imam who is behind the scenes. Even during the time of the Prophet in which this verse was revealed, there is a group that is meant to become learned in the religion and to warn their people. In other words, it implies that therefore there is somebody on the receiving end who is expected to follow their teachings. Otherwise, why would God say that these people should go back and warn their people if their people were not expected to follow them. So the people are expected to take heed from this warning, to take learning from the education that these are imparting. Now, when you know that this is something that has to happen, did we get any other further clarifications from Ahl al-Bayt, from the dictates of sound reason that God has given us by creating us as people with intellect, with sound reason, with a sense of morality? You have many different people that claim to be learned, claim to be scholars, claim to be maraja. Who is qualified to be followed? 
who is it amongst them that we can refer to as meant by this verse? As meant by when the Imams tell us, according to the reports, فَرْجُعُوا فِيهَا إِلَى رُوَاتِ حَدِيثِنَا Refer to those, and this is where the word marja comes from perhaps, by the way. The word irji'u, it has the same root as the word marja. Raja'a, irji, raj, raja'a, irja is the imperative form of refer, to refer. Refer back to them. They are the reference points. They are the scholars, the transmitters of the reports of Ahlul Bayt who understand them with specialty, with profound understanding, that are expected to be modeling the behavior of Ahlul Bayt according to those teachings. They are the ones qualified to be reference points when the Imam is not directly accessible to us. And actually, even when the Prophet was directly accessible, and even when the Imams were directly accessible, this verse still applied. So this is a sanctioned, this is a sanctioned, justified, legislated type of phenomenon that the followers of Ahlul Bayt practice. Whether it was ta the time of the Prophet, the time of the Imams, or during the time in which the Imam is not directly accessible, though he is behind the scenes. This referral to the scholars. But the question is, who should I refer to? What scholars? What are the qualifications? The most obvious qualifications are their integrity, their upright character. Generally, if you refer to the scholars, are you talking about just any scholar that has studied about Islam and studied about Shiism? Or are you referring to somebody who is part and parcel of the mission of Islam? Part and parcel of the project of the 12th Imam. These are not individuals who simply academically studied about the 12th Imam or academically studied about the nature of Shiism. This, these are individuals who adopt Shiism, 12er Shiism as their worldview, who adopt the belief in the immaculate nature of these Imams, Imams as their worldview, who believe that they are being the reference points for the followers of the 12th Imam who is behind the scenes as the pure conduit, the immaculate, impeccable conduit between the heavens and the earth, representing the message of Prophet Muhammad on earth impeccably. If any given scholar does not follow that worldview, they're not qualified to be followed. If they do not believe in the 12 Imams, which you know, you've come to know with knowledge and certainty, they are not qualified to be followed in this sense. If they do not believe that the 12th Imam lives and he's behind the scenes as that guarantee of God's word on earth, as that guarantee of being the representative of the Nadir of Muhammad then they are not qualified to be followed to begin with. No matter how much they've studied, no matter how many years they've spent, no matter how many charitable organizations they manage, or how many charitable works they do. If they do not believe that this representative of God on earth is what a representative of God on earth should be, representing the message in word and in action impeccably, being the guarantee behind the scenes that he knows exactly whenever anything is going wrong in the strategy, he, is, he has the knowledge, he has the correct understanding, he has the guidance, he has the sirat al-mustaqeem, the upright straight path at every moment and in every choice to know when to intervene, when to be leading others to do things behind the scenes, how to manage the affairs behind the scenes. If they do not believe that the Imam of the time is as such and has the asma in that sense, they are not the ones to be followed. The ones to be followed are the ones who are in line with that worldview you know to be true. If they have that same worldview, okay, then they fulfilled one of the conditions to be followed. If you know of any scholar that became reputable and people followed him, but then he came to, you came to know, oh, the scholar... He has weird views about the Imam. It's not the view that I believe to be true about the Imam. Okay, why are you following somebody who doesn't even have the same worldview as you? 
How are they qualified to be followed if they don't have the belief in the asma of the imam? And you believe in the asma of the imam. How does that make sense? How can you follow them if they don't even believe that the imam is alive? Or that the imam is behind the scenes and he knows exactly with its perfect knowledge that God gives him when to intervene, when not to intervene. When to, how to organize things behind the scenes. And he is the one that is on the Sirat al Mustaqim amongst those who God has blessed. Alladina and Amta Alayhim. Sirat Alladina and Amta Alayhim. Guide us to the straight path. Guide us to that path, the path of those you have blessed. Who is that person that represents that path, who is on that path? Who is that walking, talking path every day? Who is that representative of the Itra Ahl al Bayt which never separates from the Quran? That is mentioned in Hadith al Thaqalain. Who is that? If that person, that supposed scholar, does not believe in the Asma in that sense, they are not qualified to be followed. You may like that they do good works. You may like that they have charitable works, like even some non Muslims have. Many non Muslims have charitable works. You may praise that and you say, wait, that's a good thing to do. We should do stuff like that. Great. But that's not the criteria for following the representative of the Imam when the Imam is not accessible to you directly. These are not the types of scholars that are the ones who have tafaqqah fi deen that have the proper understanding of the religion because their worldview has some missing links in it. If you know it yourself, you know that the Imam has to be ma'soom. You know that the Imam has to be guarded from committing errors or falling short from that guidance then why would you follow a marja or a scholar who doesn't believe that? It doesn't make sense. Because if you believe that this marja is your link to doing what the imam would be pleased with, how would you follow somebody who doesn't even believe in the imam the way you do? This is one thing to consider. Another thing to consider, and I, I don't know if I'll be able to cover it entirely right now, but I'll try to give an overview of it, is this. We have many different scholars, many different maraja, and some, they, many of them have different opinions on many different issues. It's a misconception when some people think, oh, they're all, they all have almost the same ideas. That's not true. They disagree on many issues, and many issues of the law. Yes, and issues of the faith and the worldview, belief in the 12 imams, belief that the imam is ma'soom. Yes, the qualified scholars agree on these general principles. But when it comes to deducing the laws, when it comes to deducing the principles and the laws, they disagree on many issues. So, who is qualified for us to follow? If that person has reached the level of expertise, what is expertise? This is a general sound-minded understanding that we have as people who live with sound minds in intellectual societies. You know that there are some things that are, that make sense because there are many clues that make, make sure that it makes sense. How do you know somebody's an expert in medicine? How do you know somebody's an, an expert in engineering? How do you know somebody's an expert in fixing cars? How do you know somebody's an expert in cooking? How do you know some, there's different areas of expertise that we deal with in society, and it's something that has been going on ever since human societies have been around. Communities in which there are different functions performed by different individuals who have different specialties. How do you know somebody's really an expert and a specialist? Sometimes you know by testing it out. You test them. You see how successful are they in fixing my car. If they're successful at fixing my car, that gives them one point in my scale. And the more I know that they're successful in fixing cars from different individuals' experiences, the more I think that this guy is really an expert. Sometimes you test them by seeing their results, like a surgeon. How do you know they're so successful? You think, well, okay, how many surgeries has he successfully completed? How many people have been cured due to his preparations and his, his actions as a physician? This is one way we know things, by testing them out. But there are other times when we can't test things out. You can't test things out. For example, 
the first, before that surgeon committed, did any surgeries. Before he did any surgeries. How did you know he was a, a competent surgeon? Why would you risk your life with that surgeon if you do not know if he's a competent surgeon? He hasn't done any surgeries yet. How do you know he's competent? How does anybody risk their lives with going to that surgeon, surgeon if they can't test them out first? How do they know? Well, the ways that common people would do it is they would see where did he study? Who were his teachers? What is his reputation amongst his peers and in the institutions of learning that can tell the difference between a surgeon and a charlatan and somebody who's just doing pseudoscience? How do you know? You ask about them. You see what were their qualifications. And sometimes I, I may have studied engineering, I may have studied Islamic studies, but that doesn't make me qualified to tell the difference between a physician and somebody who's not a physician. I may be able to in some very basic things, but I won't necessarily be able to when it comes to more complicated issues. So how do I figure out whether this guy really knows what he's doing with my car or he's rigging my car? How do I know? You know by the person's reputation in the right places. Not just any reputation. What does it matter if this physician convinced a group of of people that don't know anything about medicine that he's a physician. What does that make a difference? You need to see what their reputation is in the institutions that can tell the difference between a physician and somebody who's not a physician. Between somebody who has studied at an advanced level and somebody who has not. You see what they, what their evaluation is of this person. People who deal with cars, have dealt with cars throughout their whole lives, who can tell the difference between a real mechanic and somebody who's just testing things out on your car. Similarly, when it comes to knowing who is a qualified marja, it's not about the reputation that the marja has in your center at home. The center at home doesn't have qualified people who can tell the difference. Generally, unless you have a very high level scholar in your community. By the way, when I say somebody can tell the difference, even I, who have studied for a few years in the Hausa, I don't claim to be able to tell the difference. The ones who can tell the difference between a marja and somebody who is a high level scholar but not yet a marja, somebody who is a mushta and somebody who is not, these are people who have reached a level of bahat kharij and have spent several years in bahat kharij and even then they may not be able to tell the difference. So where do you look for the reputation of the marja? You look for the reputation of the marja in your own community or in who's the majority that people follow in your town or your village or in your area? Or do you look for the reputation in the hausa, Where there are people that can tell the difference? Where the marja is continuously challenged by scholars around him, by students who have reached a very high level that can challenge him? In those areas of learning, in those centers of learning, that is where you look for the reputations. If in those areas of learning, this marja is known to be a mushtahid for sure, nobody doubts he's a mushtahid, he's reached that level of expertise, yeah, then that reputation might give you confidence, you become, you're content that, yeah, indeed, I would, he wouldn't have had that type of reputation there unless he really did reach that level. Or you look for testimonies, shahadat, Testimonies by other established experts also in the Hausa who are known to be established experts. They are teaching Bahth Kharij lessons. They have many students who are also of a high caliber that can tell the difference between a qualified mujtahid and somebody who is just making a claim without proper justification. Those testimonies of such upright experts, shuhud, udul, min ahl al khibra, when they testify and they say, I believe based on my evaluation of this individual, he has reached a level of ishtihad. Then you know this person is a qualified mujtahid. Okay, these are a couple things. That I'm, there may be other ways to also become confident based on sound-minded bases and foundations. But the point is, we have to be critical about what we're using as a criteria for determining this person to be a qualified expert or not. Just as we would when we're acting reasonably in any other aspect of our life when we're looking for an expert. In any area. 
When you want to be fair and sound-minded, how do you look for a qualified physician, a qualified engineer, a qualified architect, a qualified cook, a qualified mechanic, a qualified teacher, and so on and so forth? What are the criteria? When it comes to religion, and it comes to the answers, the marja, he can't test out the results for you in this world. Like a, like a physician can in doing different surgeries, and you see he's successful in his surgeries. You can't do that with a marja. Why? Because the results are, the answers are with the imam, and the imam is not directly accessible to us right now. Unless the imam comes out and tells us, this marja was right in his opinion in this issue, and that marja was right in that opinion in that issue, how would we know? So we have to look for other ways to know what is the sound way of determining who is qualified. That is through what I mentioned as reputations in the center of learning, like the Hausa. Reputations amongst the experts when they give testimonies, opera experts. These are a couple examples of things that you would be able to use as ways to be confident. This person is a mushtahid. And finally, because the time is up, I might elaborate on this more, inshallah, later. Finally, you have, let's say, many scholars, we all have confidence. These are mushtahideen, no doubt. Their reputation in the Hawza is beyond, beyond skepticism. The scholars that are, these are a number of scholars known in the Hawza to be mushtahideen. There is no doubt about them. Okay, can I just choose any one of them? Or is there another criteria that I have to be careful about? And to delve into this further, I think I need a little bit more time to explain the next point. But in a nutshell, as a just general outline, there are two levels of this type of a discussion. One is the level for those who are not experts, and the other is the level for those who are experts. Right now, the mushtahideen, they themselves disagree on whether you could just follow any of them when they disagree, or you have to follow the most learned amongst them if they disagree. They have their own discussions about this, they have their own research differences, their own arguments and different lines of reasoning to justify why you have to follow the most learned, look for the most learned amongst them, the alam, or not. They disagree amongst each other on this. That is a discussion amongst the experts. Those who have access to the Quran and the Hadith in a qualified way where they can make arguments that are justified and based on expertise, they have this discussion amongst themselves. Do I have to follow the alam or not? They have that discussion. That is a second level discussion. But as for the first level discussion, which is for the non-expert, like me, like probably all of us, the, ex the non-experts, those who are not mushtahideen, those who are not mushtahideen, for us, we, are, we don't have access to that second discussion because we don't have the tools to engage in it in a very competent way. So what do we do as people who don't have that access? We can't delve into the proof from the hadith and the proof from the Quran about do you have to follow the alam or not. What do we do? For us on this level, what do you think we do? The answer is... Let's think about it, inshallah, we'll continue tomorrow. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala ahli bayti al tayyibin al tahirin. Allah, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala ahli bayti al tayyibin al tahirin.